Yeah, well, my name at birth was not Jay Frankston, it was Joseph Frankenstein. And uh, I'm going to tell you candidly that uh, uh, I was born in Germany. It's not something I say very readily, and most people don't know that. They think I'm born in France. Uh, I lived in Germany for a couple of years only. I don't remember any of it, because I was very young when my parents moved to France. So my earliest recollection is in France, and somehow being born in Germany is like, a, at least to me, a, a blotch on my past. The fact is I was born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1928, and uh, my father's name was Max Wolf Frankenstein, and my mother's name was Dora Funt. My father was born in Poland, and to my knowledge, uh, his father before him and maybe his grandfather before him were, and my mother also were both born in Poland. I was around, and against my recollection, around 17, he had his own barbershop. And the, then the pogroms came. Uh, the Cossacks came on horseback with sabers drawn and, and this went around town uh, raping women and beating people up and breaking things and so forth. Uh, uh, Hitler, in his crystal nights, didn't do anything new, he just did it bigger and better, but the Cossacks did it before, and they smashed stores. It so happens that my father was not there when they came, so they smashed his barbershop into smithereens, and uh, uh, it scared, scared him. He decided, I better leave Poland. He went to a safe haven, which was Germany, which was supposedly a safe haven. I mean, there were lots of Jews in Germany uh, who were integrated, because the Jews in Poland were not so integrated. They sort of kept to themselves. That's probably why the Polish law separated the Jews from the Poles, because the Poles, the Jews in Poland, were, so they kept their own identity, whereas the Jews in Germany were very proud to be Germans, very German, you know. And they didn't, to the, to the end, they denied that Hitler would ever harm them. When he was 20 or so, 20 or 21, he opened his little tobacco shop, cigarettes, cigars, tobacco, in Frankfurt. And then, oof, Hitler's uh, activities became overt and, and radical and disastrous. And somehow, this is why I'm still alive, my father had a flair for these things. And so he packed us all up and took us out of Germany into France. And so he opened up a leather manufacturing business. Manufacturing leather coats, leather jackets, leather hats, you know. And, uh, and within a few years, from what I know, uh, he uh, had a, uh, a going business which was selling to a lot of department stores and he was doing good, very well. Everybody had a maid in those days. I mean, it wasn't like you had to be very rich to have a maid, but we were, we were very comfortable. We weren't rich, I would say, but hey, we were well off. And uh, the, so my, 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 when we, we had dinner around the table, my parents would talk about business. Children should be seen and not heard. And uh, there was a, a a wire hanging in the middle of the table with a little buzzer, a bell actually, and you pressed it and the maid would come in and take away the plates and serve them, and that sort of thing. So, and then it began, you know, like uh, the anti-Semitism that was rampant in Germany spread to France. And those were the days when you had the, 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 the conflict between the left and the right throughout the world, not just in Germany. I mean, that's in Germany, Hitler came at the expense of communists, the communists. Well, the same thing was happening in France. You had the, the Front Populaire with Leon Blum on one side, and then you had Dola Roc, uh, who was the right wing. They were called the Croix de Feu. That's what they were called. The Crosses of Fire is what they were called. They were the right wing extremists. And uh, uh, they adopted Hitler's anti-Semitic propaganda 
and they passed it on to their kids. To such an extent that when I was nine years old, I recall many times uh, coming home from school and finding uh, on my notebooks, the ones that I had had in class that I must have left at my desk when I went to play or whatever, finding on those notebooks uh, things like a dirty Jew, a down with Jews, down with Judaism, death to Jews, and so forth. I, that's what I have on the little notebook that I have here, uh, written by other nine-year-old kids. That's the part. Written by other nine-year-old kids who had already been brainwashed into anti-Semitism, you know? But I couldn't understand. Uh, then, uh, uh, I mean, like where other kids get out of school and, and jump around, oh, we're free and we're going home and we're going to play or whatever else. I, I would take my books and I'd look left and I'd look right. That wasn't it. The fact that it was, the name was Frankenstein was a clear indication that I was Jewish. So when I walked out of school, the kids, uh, I'd look left and right because, and then I'd run. Because very frequently you'd say, there goes Frankenstein, the, 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 the Jew, let's get him. Allez, Frank Estelle, le Yupin, on va l'attraper, let's go, you know, and they run. When I was nine years old, I woke up one morning and found a piece of paper next to my bed. And there was something written on it. It was obviously written by me because I recognized my own handwriting. But I didn't remember writing it. It was obviously written at night and some of it wasn't one on top of the other. And it said, Translated into English, I see a glimmer in the distance and it is coming closer. And it is coming closer and soon it shall be upon me and I shall see all there is to see. And I shall know all there is to know. That's all it said. Uh, when I read that, it was... I don't know what the word is, but it... went right through me. And at the same time scared the living daylights out of me. So I didn't know what to do about that, and I knew I couldn't talk to my parents. There was no line of communications open, so out of desperation, I turned to uh, my teacher in school. His name was Maître Pin, P-I-N. And uh, he was an adult, which is what I needed. I needed somebody to understand, and I don't know if he did understand, but at least he seemed to, which was enough for me to feel better about it. And then he gave me some advice, and he said, I want you to carry a piece of paper and pencil with you all the time in your pocket. And whenever you feel like, whenever you feel something, I want you to stop whatever you're doing and write, write it down. That would be my suggestion. And I took his suggestion, I took his advice, and I carried a piece of paper out. And I did stop. Please understand, I've written this, okay? This is a book, this is one of the books that I've written. At least that's the introduction to one of the books that I've written. And, uh, uh, and I, I, you know, I, get off the swing sometimes in the middle of or interrupt the marble game and just write little things on a piece of paper. And every night I'd take that piece of paper and put it, uh, dump it in the cardboard box that was at the bottom of my closet uh, right next to this huge quantity of marbles. And there was a lot of stuff on it. A lot of things that I wrote I can't recall. And I was 12 years old, it happened again, the same thing. I'll just interrupt and simply say it happened. The same identical thing happened when I was 12 years old. I woke up one morning, found that same piece of paper next to my bed with the same kind of handwriting, mine, using the same language. I see a glimmer in the distance and it is coming closer and it is coming closer and soon it shall be upon me and I shall see all there is to see and I shall know all there is to know. You know? And I felt a tremendous leap forward with it. Not in any particular sense other than a sense of, of knowledge without specifics. I don't know, there's no translation. Uh, I will simply skip over and say it happened again when I was 15 years old in the, in the States. You know, uh, when that happened was the same identical thing in English this time. Uh, out of desperation, I turned to my mother and I told her. I don't know if she did or didn't, but it appears to me that she laughed to my which was disastrous for me. It cut the umbilical cord, to my knowledge, that's where it was cut, right there. And I had to go elsewhere to find some kind of an answer. And I spent many years. And then I, it happened in when I was 20, and, but this time in a, in a complete sense, a feeling of really knowing, and it happened again when I was 40. Uh, 
All I know is that when the Germans invaded France, first we thought the Maginot Line was going to stop them. And then when they bypassed the Maginot Line, we said, well, but they'll be stopped. Nobody, nobody, I, mean, I know of nobody, could conceive of the Germans taking Paris. It would be as inconceivable as the Germans taking New York or LA or whatever. It was just somewhere along the way, they'll be stopped, and that's it. That's, you know, it's just. Uh, but uh, there was fear. And then they started, the bombs started falling. St the balcony covered, the, the balcony covered the entire length of the apartment. And so we stood on the balcony, and sure enough, we could see bombs falling in Paris. But when that happened, my father said, well, we can't stay in Paris. That doesn't mean we can't stay in Paris because we're afraid that the Germans are going to take Paris, but because we're afraid of bombardment. So my father, my mother, my brother and I got into the car. My parents took everything that was portable, of, uh, jewelry, or money, or cash, or whatever else that they could, and with some small things with them. And uh, we left everything, locked everything up, and drove three hours south. And when they took Paris, we went further south. Uh, Tours, Blois, Bordeaux, uh, Toulouse, Bayonne, Biarritz, uh, then over to uh, Marseille, and ultimately wound up in the south of France in Marseille. Uh, there was a grapevine leading right into that little circle of, hand, of, of, of Jews who would, you know, who, and somehow they had information because most of the Jews came from Poland and Germany and, and, and Hungary and so forth. And a lot of them sort of knew there's something that was going on that it was terrible. They knew it was terrible. And so I know that my father immediately made steps. He was going to take us out of there because it was a matter of, do, if we wanted to survive, we got to get out of there. He sensed that. And uh, uh, we went through Spain and Portugal in July of 1942. And we took the last ship to leave Europe from Lisbon. It was a Portuguese ship called the Serpa Pinto. Yeah. And this is even in, uh, in uh, Portuguese. And uh, on the back of it, it says, En souvenir du voyage d'Europe en Amérique sur le Serpa Pinto du 6 au 21 juin 1942. It says that, which means in, in, in remembrance of a trip from Europe to America on the Serpa Pinto from the 6th to the 21st of June 1942. It says, j'ai alors 13 ans. I am, I am now 13 years old. That's what it says. It was a long, long sail zigzagging across the ocean to avoid U-boats, German U-boats, and ultimately, uh, and I got seasick to, uh, I mean, I feel like the whole period of time, my recollection is one of being sick all the time, and ultimately wound up in, in New York. When my parents became citizens of the United States, uh, uh, they changed the name uh, to uh, Frankston. Actually, the, I think somebody said, don't you want to change your name? And uh, so my father said, well, and they said Frankston. So, okay, so they changed the name to Frankston. And the next thing I know, I'm sitting on a sidewalk trading comic books. Captain Marvel and Shazam and, and uh, God, what else, and Batman and, you know, trading comic books. It's, it's, you know, and the English came. New York was wonderful. I mean, my father was, 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 my father was delighted. My father said, wait, I, I went to the, I, went, I was lost. I went up to the policeman and I said, Mr. Can you maybe, and the policeman said, red Yiddish. You mean there was a Jewish policeman? He said, he's, you know, this was, you know, people, with, there were a lot of, New York was, as you know, New York, the third Jewish. My father, he was, you know, in his own swimming pool here, in his own, whatever they call him, you know, he was, you know, everybody spoke Yiddish, garment is like everybody, Yiddish, I mean, he was, yeah, he had a Jewish newspaper, and, you know, uh, in France, you, you didn't say you were Jewish. You know, you don't, you know, you, to a certain extent, uh, uh, I know I, and my brother and I both were embarrassed uh, uh, about that my parents had a Jewish accent or even a foreign accent. Uh, uh, here every, in the U.S., being a foreigner is, is quite normal. There's lots of, in France, there's no such thing. Then, you know, they said to, to my father, what are you going to do? I don't know. 
So I can always be a barber again. My father was going to be a barber. So for a while he looked at a chicken farm in New Jersey. But then my father is this very intuitive individual. And uh, he looked around and he said, well, it looks like there are no zippers around. What do you mean? Well, Talon was the biggest zipper manufacturer in the, in the U.S. at the time, and Conmar was number two, and I think Ideal was number three, and, and everybody else sold, everybody was working for the army, so there were no zippers. And every, the dresses had buttons, and the pants had buttons, and everything was back to buttons. And I don't know how he did it, but somehow my father got it together, and he bought, went out and bought six or eight sacks of clothes, potato sacks of clothes, just a portion of the clothes where the zipper was, you know, that it had to be cut out. And my father, my mother, my brother and I, uh, we took the zippers and took the thread off, you know, and took the toothbrushes, spit on them and scrubbed them, you know, and my father put them in a little box. And I think he's the one who coined the word reconditioned zipper. I think I got a reconditioned zipper. So then he went to the garment industry and he says, by himself, and he says, zippers. You want to see the buyer, the buyer come in. Zippers, he says, we ain't got zippers. He says, zippers, we ain't got them. I got zippers. You got zippers? Show me. Oh, good. Yeah, we'll take the zippers. Well, from eight sacks to 28 sacks. From 28 to 500 sacks. And the next thing you know, hey, we better hire a couple of people to help us. But the thing is this. He had lost whatever he made on his own in Poland. He rebuilt it in Germany, and however small it was for his age, it was real good, he lost it. He went to France and rebuilt it again with leather manufacturing, and he lost it. Here he was on his fourth time, and we're talking about a man who's now in his 40s with two grown children. Like when we came here, I was 13 and a half. My, my brother was a year and a half older, so 15, something like that, short of 15. Well, if he, if he worked from five, if he, instead of quitting at five, if he worked till six, it would mean an extra thousand or whatever it is, dollars. If he worked another hour, another thousand dollars. So he'd come home at 10 o'clock at night and be at business seven in the morning with the, and hoarded it. Uh, hoarded it, I mean hoarded. I mean became a miser uh, with his family and with himself, of course. As an adult, I can see all the reasoning, the rationale, things he'd lost, he didn't want to lose it again, he wanted to make sure he had enough. It killed him. And he, had, he was diabetic all his life. He took a shot of uh, insulin regularly, every day. Uh, he developed a heart problem, bad blood circulation. At the end, he had heart attacks. Then uh, bad blood circulation, he lost a leg, he was amputated from the knee down. And then uh, he had to give up the business. But the fact is that when I came here, I had been educated. They educate you in France. You learn. I mean, you learn, you really learn. And I, I had taken, God, I had taken English, and I had taken four or five years of Latin. By the time I was 13, I'm talking about, I don't know what I've taken. I've physics, chemistry, uh, philosophy, psychology. I've taken all these huge quantity of courses, and I was, I hated it. Please understand. I mean, you were taught because you had to learn. I mean, there was no way in which I could not learn. If they, you didn't learn, or if you were not misbehaved in school, then my teacher would come over and pick me up by the sideburns, and that hurts. And there's no way in which you can't hook here. You come home, you say, oh, mommy, did you pick up my sideburns? Immediately, mommy comes running into the principal saying, what's going on with your teachers and how come that? Over there, that's not the way it goes. If you went home and said, mommy, your te the teacher picked me up by my sideburns, my father would come over and smack me across the face and he probably deserved it. So you learn because you, not, you didn't like it, but you learned. In retrospect, I'm grateful. I am a very, very educated person. So when I got here at 13 and a half, they wanted to put me in junior high school. I said, no, I like please take the test. You give me test. And so they uh, gave me a test, and then they said, okay, we'll put you second year high school. No, no, please, I'd like one more test, and one more test, and after the third test, they put me in uh, as a uh, senior in high school, and I graduated from high school at the age of 15. But uh, my primary interest between the ages of 15 and the age of, uh, of uh, 
of 20 was uh, my search because as I told you when I was 15 I had this experience again and, uh, and my mother's uh, not responding to my uh, quest, question or whatever or even uh, sympathizing or understanding and put me out there and led me to uh, go on searches. So I, I would say that between years 15 and 20, on one level anyway, I went through a spiritual quest in which I went through the Old Testament and the New Testament and then I went through the Koran and then I went through the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita and I went through every single religion inside out from uh, inside out, every single religion right down to, uh, to uh, the high faith even. You know? And at the same time I formulated my own beliefs and I hung out in Washington Square and preached. Not quite 15 years old but overwhelmed by an incredible sense of grief. Even though I, I can't honestly say that I have suffered. Personally, you know, not really, not, nothing of any consequence. But somehow I felt this overwhelming sense of grief and uh, learned of the extent of the monstrosity that took place of six million. Jews, 12 million people. It was very difficult for me to understand, and I kept asking, why? Uh, the thing that bothered me most of all, if you want to know, is the fact that on looking, there were no, there was no outbreaks in those camps. There was no, no attempts to resist the fate they ultimately uh, walked into. And I, I, I couldn't understand. I had a real hard time with that. Where was God when six million of his chosen people, you know, is what everybody was saying, all the Jews were saying, where was God when six million of his chosen people uh, died in, 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 in hell? And, and my answer is, why didn't they do anything? Why didn't they do anything? Why didn't they rebel? Why didn't they fight? Why didn't they... Uh, I want to tell you this. I didn't, like I said, I didn't feel the Holocaust, personally. I felt it afterwards. I felt it when I came, I came to, the, to the States and when I became aware of what had gone on and realized that I had walked through the coals without having felt them. I realized that I had been gone through hell without knowing it and that I could have been snapped up like anyone else and disappeared. That came to me like a, like a, like a ton of bricks and it made me uh, uh, Aside from search for reasons why, aside from trying to search how humanity reacts, aside from trying to find out who I am and where my place is in the world. And then I met Monique on July 7th, 1950. When I met Monique, please understand this is my view of it. Monique was a totally independent person who lived by herself, had her own apartment, had a car, had a job at the United Nations, a good job, was totally financially independent, had $7,000 in the bank at the time, which was a lot of money, you know, and she looked like she was her own person. I, on the other hand, was a student going to law school, uh, still very uh, uh, insecure financially, uh, working as a waiter uh, to try and pay my way through law school. But Monique, however, however uh, financially and otherwise independent, was really very much of an emotionally uh, frail person. You could sense the suffering, the sadness in her. And I, it is my nature to need to be needed and to come with, when you, I come upon a Wounded bird, I, this, it appeals to my, my sense of whatever. And so, and uh, it took uh, 35, uh, well, 20, it took, it took her till she was 35, 40 years old. It means like 15, 20 years together. 
before I felt that she was confident enough, because she always felt she had no sense of belonging, that once her family was taken, she didn't belong anywhere. She didn't belong with the Le Marchand, they were real nice, but she was imposing. She didn't belong with the Frischter, they were family, very distant, but she was imposing. And even though we were in love and married and had, had kids, somehow there was an insecurity that this was going to be taken away from her too. Somewhere in the process of this, I felt an absolute need because I love this lady. I love this lady. I went into her past. It was necessary for me to go into her past. So I felt that I that now the Holocaust was not was much closer from A to Z because she lost everything, absolutely everything. She was only 13. I see a glimmer in the distance and it is coming closer and it is coming closer and soon it shall be upon me and I shall see all there is to see and I shall know all there is to know. It all had something to do with spiritualism. It all had to do with something with who am I and what am I doing here and why. You know, questions. I'm still doing it. And when uh, uh, when I we came here, uh, we didn't have a place to stay, so I went everywhere looking for a place to stay. And there was one commune at Pomitera, an apple picking commune. We were invited to stay with them, so we stayed with Pomitera uh, and. We stayed with them for a few weeks. We put a, a stand up on 128 itself. So, how many people in this commune that I were in? We, we were seven uh, men and, and, and eight or ten women. Couldn't find a place to rent. And this, ha this house was for sale. And this house, I don't know if you saw the back of this house, in back, 
of that way. Then because what you see here is the kitchen and I took on uh, uh, marijuana cases, legal cases invol inv involving hel helping who, who were, uh, must, which are charged with, uh, with marijuana growing. We got involved with, uh, with the hippies, uh, the, the, the Men Mendocino, um, was like a, a refuge. Uh, there was there were more uh, musicians here. This became a very artistic and then musician hangout. I mean, all, all these people were famous, became, and they all came here and sang for us and played music for us, for us, for nothing. In other words, <laughs> they played for us, we didn't have to pay. I saw more plays, more musicians, uh, more, uh, more artists here uh, than I did in New York City. The most important thing in my life and in Monique's life is that she, she was Jewish, she's Jewish, and I was Jewish. <clears throat> that op opened the door to talk about, or write about just the Holocaust. Excuse me for choking up a little. Monique's parents were taken and died in Auschwitz in the Holocaust. Ah, ah man. Made me feel uh, the empathy for these and for the terrible things that they went through. The, 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 her, her parents died in, in the ovens. It made me feel that you had to do something and this was a terrible thing for them to have done. I needed to, to give the people an understanding of what was happening here. They, they, they couldn't believe it. How could they believe that six million Jews died every year? I went to the schools and to the people. I gave lectures on the Holocaust. Please understand it. I started out in New York and, and went out and looked for Santa Claus. In, even, even in New York, I found out how, how children, poor children in Harlem and other places were poor and needed five, five, five things to find themselves. <laughs> so, I, I, uh, I, found, I uh, found out that they were put at the post office in Manhattan. The whole third floor was full of that, and among other things, there were letters addressed to Santa Claus at the post office. I went down there and asked if I, what they do with them. And, and he told me, well, after, after Christmas, we, we gave it, we, we incinerated them. Uh, so I went out and I went out and bought toys. Uh, I went down to the post office and we, I got from, from the post office and a number of very needy children writing letter in desperate, desperate need. And I sent the kids a, te a telegram. Got, got, dear, G dear Jimmy, I got your letter. I'll be at your house on Christmas Day. Please wait for me. And so I took all these uh, uh, toys 
And they all went into the uh, and my, my kids helped, of course. And we all had a basement full of toys. And we sorted them out. Boys, girls, ten year, nine year olds. Uh, and showed up at a people's house. So when I rang the doorbell at their house, the kids jumped up and down. You see, Mom, you see? He came. Ah. And I gave, gave uh, and I took each one of them and talked to them and talked to them about believing. Uh, Santa Claus does exist. But if you believe in, 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 in something, then, then you, and you believe it's strong enough, uh, you could uh, make your, your dreams come true. Over the years, I went every year, every year. So when I came from New York, the one thing that I that I that took with me that was made meaningful was the uh, Santa Claus. It all had something to do with spiritualism. It all had to do something with who am I and what am I doing here and why? You know, questions. I'm still doing it. Sixty some odd years later. Some, as a result of all the events that occurred before, the, 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 the loneliness, the anti-Semitism and whatnot. Somewhere in their eyes, I, I touched off a spark of some kind, accidentally. And I've frankly been living on it and feeding off it all my life. I still am to this day. It is my, my totally my motor. Uh, it's like I know something. I was, at one time, I saw something, something huge and, and, and enormous and and all-encompassing, and although I sometimes have doubts whether it really did happen, because when it happens like this and it only lasts for a moment, uh, you have questions, did it really happen, and so forth. Uh, but I can't fully deny it because there is an underlying sense deep down inside that I have some, I've touched something. And uh, we feel helpless, and as a result, we don't participate in life. We sit in our little corners uh, in front of our VCRs and, and hide from each other. But if the truth be known, we're all on the same side. There's no us and them, as far as I'm concerned. It's all us. Same thing with politics and government and whatnot. We keep saying the guys in Washington. We are the guys in Washington. Not because we voted for them, but because they do what we're doing. They speak for us. And or think they do. I don't know. I don't have any answers. A lot of questions. I spend a lot, a lot of time talking about the Holocaust. I talk about the Holocaust in schools, in middle schools primarily, because that's the age when they're just right. Elementary, they're too young. High school, they're just already too old. They're at the right age to try and explain to them. And one of the things I tell them is it couldn't have happened if people had spoken up. And the thing is, most of them didn't because they were afraid they were the only ones to speak up. And yet, if they could have spoken up, it would have realized that everyone else felt the same way, that 85% of the French people would not have gone long and it couldn't have happened. 
So when I tell this and everybody says, yeah, right, and look, it's happening today and nobody's doing anything about it, right? And I say, yeah, what are you talking about? And they say, well, look at Bosnia, or look at the Rwanda, or look at the Haiti or wherever else, and they keep talking. And I say, wait, if there is a lesson to be learned from the Holocaust, it isn't about the thing that happens on the other side of the street, but what happens in your own backyard and what is of consequence is what are you doing about the garbage that's being thrown out of the window by the car that's driving in front. And if you don't pull up and say, that's not nice, you haven't said anything. And if the guy in front of you drops a cigarette on the floor and steps on it, and if you don't say, that's not nice, you're not, you're participating. Uh, that's my general feeling, I don't know. I sit in a, ca in a restaurant and when people smoke, the guy at the next table will smoke a cigarette. And it bothers, bothers me. Now, please understand, if it doesn't bother you, you don't have to say anything. But if it bothers you, just say it. I turn around and say, I'm sorry, but you know, your smoke bothers me. And if he says, what do you want me to do about it? My answer is nothing. And I really mean that. I really mean I don't want you to do anything. I really don't. Go ahead and smoke. But I do want you to know that it bothers me. At that point, I feel that you have something to put in the scale to evaluate what you're doing between you want to smoke and you're bothering me, and you make a decision. And if your decision is to go ahead and smoke, by all means, please do, I respect it. But I have enough confidence and faith in humanity that if people out there just expressed themselves and knew what they were doing, that they would do the right thing. To the things that happened to me during my lifetime, uh, such as uh, the Holocaust, of course, and, and, and my, my my disgust with the money, money society. You know, the, uh, go get your money, go, go, go after the money. I could never see that. Make, make, make enough money to, to live a good life, but don't, 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 don't be a money grubber. Look, I'm still living in the, 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 the hippie life, as you can see. But uh, uh, the life is one big ladder that you climb up if, you, if you're wise enough to do that. I, I, cho I, I chose uh, to, uh, to live here in Mendocino. Uh, I, I chose to be a lawyer, uh, and then I, then I just saw that this wasn't what I wanted. Uh, I meant something meaningful, something that, you know, choose your life, don't let it be an accident. Make your life a matter of choice. This is in there. Make your life a matter of choice. Don't, don't, don't be an accident. I bid farewell to the state of old New York, my home away from home. In the state of New York, I came of age when first I started roaming. And the trees grow.